Hi, I am Michael Allison, the developer of the Play Zone, and I am here with my good friend, Heather Abernathy, who is a polyvagal informed coach, aside from being an anesthesiologist. And when I first met Heather, I was listening to her describe a day in her life as an anesthesiologist. And not just any anesthesiologist, but an anesthesiologist who is really intent on helping her patients feel safe, not cognitively, but feel safe in, in their bodies. And when Heather was describing a day in her life, it struck me that she is living, and I would, I would bet that most healthcare providers are living in a, a work day that is just a bombardment of cues of threat and uncertainty and chaos. And it's relentless. And it struck me that we, on those of us who look at people like you, Heather, to help us when we really need help or to save our lives, I personally didn't appreciate what your day is really like. I had no idea. And it struck me that I work a lot with professional athletes mm -hmm. and they have teams to support them. They have a physio, they have a trainer, they have a head coach to help them prepare for a work day <laughs> that doesn't even come close to what your body and your nervous system is experiencing. And so that's what really struck me is that we're, we on the outside aren't appreciating what you're really facing and our lives are in your hands and how, how having that understanding both from your point of view and from my point of view as a patient could also actually help build that connection of safety mm -hmm. and understand yeah. But I just yeah. really wanted to share how much I appreciated and how it shifted my understanding of what you're facing and how little support you actually have in comparison to, to a lot of others out there. Thank you. Thanks for, first of all, thanks for having me here to have this discussion and Absolutely. for what you just said. And I think what's really interesting is that until recently, I didn't understand what my day was like either. That's all that we know. That's all that we do. And it starts, you know, with medical school and medical training. And you don't have a team because you're trained to not need anyone. Yeah. You're trained to be able to stand on your own. And if you're in the medical field, you know the term be a wall. You're trained to be wow. a wall. Don't let anyone get past you. Don't let anything get past you. Protect your peers, your colleagues, so that when you're the one on call, you're taking all the hits and nobody else is. And wow. so that is the mentality. And so you don't even know that your day is a day of threat and that you're in the defense state all the time. And so again, that wasn't until recently that I really realized that, wow, I don't ever come down or it's really hard. Like it takes a conscious effort to yeah. come down. Um, because you have to get right back there so quickly, totally. but now I have a new appreciation for how important that is to have that flexibility of your nervous system and that I can only be there for my patients and my children and my friends and my family when I'm able to really fluidly move and meet whatever demands are in front of me. Yeah. And then be able to come back into that sense of safety in yes. your body. because when I, you did another thing that really captured my attention is you there was another time where you showed an image of the 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 room after whatever happened in that room and it was horrific really just looking at it I mean it was it, you could tell there was a lot of chaos that unfolded in that room and so the reality is you are facing challenges that to stay in a safe place is really might be impossible to be completely safe in your physiology when there is real life threat 
coming at you and you're trying to save a life. And everyone around you is also feeling that too. And that whole team is, is in threat mode, right? Like yes. in an ideal world, my whole thing is called the play zone. In an ideal world, you as a team would co-regulate, you'd, you'd help each other to find enough safety and comfort and ventral vagal control to contain that highly mobilized sympathetic energy that's needed in that situation so that you could actually be in the play zone together and right. then really solve complex problems, right? Or really perform each of your skills the way you actually know how to perform. Yes. But that's ideal. And that mm -hmm. would, and I, that, it, it probably does happen sometimes. Yes, yes yeah. it does. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and, and then at other times it doesn't. But even when we're, even when we're in our play zone together and we're really mobilized to the demands of the situation, we still have to really teach our body to trust that it's okay to come back to calm. Yes. Back into homeostasis, yes. which is what you were saying. So yes. and that's how, a do you, how do you do that? How do you do that? Well, I think, first of all, I just want to say that as an anesthesiologist, the the vast majority of my days are not in chaos and crisis and trauma, um, that things are controlled and safe yeah. and it's okay to have surgery. And, um, and that being said, we are always in a state of being hyper alert. That's our job mm -hmm. to do that. And there are times when things happen, when you, there is an emergency and things have to happen very suddenly. And, I worked um, for 16 years in obstetrics. And so that's a whole nother field when things just in a second, all of a sudden become an emergency. And, but again, the vast majority of times in routine elective surgeries, you can be in the play zone um, and you are also hyper alert of everything going on and hyper vigilant. And so I think your question was, how do I come back down or how do I regulate my state? And so I do that. Um, it really starts the beginning of my day when I wake up and it goes until the end of my day. And so I'm frequently checking in with myself. I'm very aware of my state. I'm very aware of my bodily sensations. I am developing my skill of interoception of knowing what the signals inside my body are telling me, right? Like, is my heart racing? I'm very aware of my heart. I'm aware of my breathing and also um, the tension in my body. So I hold a lot of tension in my jaw. I feel like I brace for things to come at me. And so a new um, realization of, wow, how relaxed is my jaw? How yeah. tight is it? You know, my shoulders, are they up here um, ready? Just the tension in my body. And so from when I wake up, just the importance of what do I listen to as I'm getting ready? Do I have music on? Am I listening to the news, which I'm not <laughs> going to do things like that. As I go to work, I'm really aware of what I put into my mind. I'm very aware as I walk into the hospital of my breathing. I'm aware of my environment. So it used to be before I started this work, when I would walk into the hospital, I was like tunnel vision. I couldn't tell you what was going on out here. I had no idea. I was just walking. Now it's like, oh, look, there are trees over there. Who knew, you know, who knew there's trees and who knew there's this. And so I'm much more aware of orienting, of really getting my place in the world. Where am I right now compared to everything else around me? And how big is this room and how big is the sky? And, and where physically am I? That's also become very important to me to know you, my space. Can I ask you a question on that? Yeah. Yeah. And, and are you deliberately in those moments, in addition to being aware and aware of the space and orienting, are you specifically putting your attention toward the features that are available that you resonate with that, that are grounding or safe yes. or reassuring to you? Yes. Great. Yes. Yeah. So that's yeah. what I call the habit of safety. That's mm -hmm. like a component of the habit of safety is that in any environment, what is available to me? And if there's nothing available externally, then what can I find internally, mm -hmm. right? What can yes. I find internally that 
is a cue of safety to me, to my physiology. And it sounds like that's how you're orienting to the day from the very beginning. Yes. Right. From turning on music that actually is calming or maybe it's uplifting, but it's uplifting in a, in a playful way. Right. Versus being news, which could create all kinds of, of fear and danger. Right? So, right. so you're creating this, you're creating. So in my language, you're creating this ongoing habit of safety throughout the day. Yes. Yes. That's, that's my goal. And I'm doing that with my patients and I'm doing that with my colleagues and I'm doing that when I'm by myself. It's a very steady, it's very steady work, but it's not onerous. Yeah, it's, sure. Yeah, it's become just a normal part of, of who I am in my day. Constantly checking in, right? How do, how do you feel? What do you notice? What do you need? Yeah, mm -hmm. awesome. How long have you been kind of doing that? Oh, I want to say it's been like three years, three, four years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cuz when we first met too we you were talking about your sensitivity to sound. Yes. And, yeah. and as we know how tied in the sound and the regulation the neural regulation of the middle ear muscles in extracting either the sounds in a human voice or the background sounds or right. in your case the sounds of all the machines. Yeah, like exactly. That are giving you information. Exactly. If you think about, right, an anesthesiologist, what I'm doing in the operating room is I am constantly listening. That is my number one cue of safety or danger. I'm yeah. listening. I have multiple monitors going off. The amount of oxygen in your blood gives off a certain tone, a beep, your EKG tracing, everything is giving me sound. So I'm constantly surveying that and I'm constantly listening to what the surgeon's saying, what the scrub tech is saying, what the nurse is saying. It's just, again, this hypervigilance that never stops. Yeah. yeah. And, so even if you're in your safe space, even if you're in the play zone, yeah. that level of attention required is metabolically costly. Yes. Right? And so that's yes. where that recovery throughout the day whenever you can, that checking in and and you're what you're doing is you're temporarily in each of those moments, physiologically, you're you're actually downregulating your mobilized energy. You're actually yes. yeah, right. And so you're you're preparing yourself for a long day. You're coming mm -hmm. back into moments of homeostasis because even when we're playing, we're not actually supporting health, growth, and restoration. So you're finding those little little bits throughout the day to do that. And then after work or when you have your days off. Mm -hmm. You're, you yeah, can that's really important that. for recovery. And I that's, again, something also relatively new that I've come to appreciate how important that is to mm -hmm. um, figure out what it is that I need to mm -hmm. recover and to do that and to not feel guilty about that or feel like I'm being selfish with my time. It's absolutely what I need to be able to function and be the best person that I can. And um, I think it's Lisa Feldman Barrett who talks about we have a a, a brain deficit, right? Like if, if we get fatigued or overwhelmed or if we're constantly in a state of threat or um, shut down, we have a brain deficit. And so we need to replenish that. And that's going to be different for everyone. It's going to be different for whatever you need at the time, but yeah. learning what that means for you, right? Does that mean I need more sleep? Does that need mean I need to go walk in nature? Does it mean I need just time by my self or I need to eat a nourishing meal, right? Yeah. And having all those resources available to choose from, knowing oh. what they are. And that's, again, I want to emphasize that this is a practice. This isn't something that you just know how to do automatically. So to be kind and gracious with yourself. Again, when I first started, I literally did not know what I needed. I didn't know what I liked. I just had been doing what I needed to do for so long that I started at this level that was, does this feel good? This feels good. This doesn't feel good. Like I, sometimes I didn't know. And I had to sit with that for a while, you know? And so it's not just like, oh, just know what you need and go do it. It's oh. sometimes it's a practice and that's, that's okay. And that's how it's going to be. And you'll, you'll learn.
thanks for sharing that because I think a yeah. lot of people feel like I, I was I'm helping this attorney try to pass her bar for mm. the third time and when we first started getting into what you're sharing about just becoming aware of yourself and then sort of the next practice for her in that habit of safety was to start to find those things that just like you said that actually nurture your physiology that feel good for your body that yeah and, and she actually had a moment when she did that practice on her own where she got really sad and she got kind of depressed mm-hmm. because she realized she didn't know what those things were mm-hmm. because she wasn't she didn't ever really put her attention on that no one no one had helped and and none of it we like you were talking about when we first started talking, we get so taught and conditioned to separate from what our body needs that we just will ourselves with more discipline and willpower and mental grit and all that. That's how we become quote successful. Yes. We're not being taught like, what are the things that actually really nurture you? Who are the people? Where are the places? What times of day? And so she actually had a, we had to work through that. Like, that's okay. Right. But very much like you, just let's start at what, what might and notice, but it's not, so you're not alone. And most of us, most of us. And I think it's, it's important to also take a a step back and say, just going into your body, just noticing what's in your body can be extremely overwhelming at first. Absolutely. So it's not like you just drop in and say, oh, I feel this right? You have to titrate it. It's such a small noticing at first, because there's a reason you haven't done that. It's protected you. It's gotten you to where you are. But now in order to do things differently, you need to start checking in. And it's not just, oh, I feel, (laughs) I feel extreme grief, right? No, you can't start there. Mm -hmm. Because I'm guessing when your client felt sad, right? There's grief there. There's a loss of, oh my gosh, all these years where I didn't even know who I was or what I wanted. Yes. No, and, really good point. You know, really needing good. to have someone with you to process that information. Yeah. And like you said, titrate it very slowly. It's not about going deep, you right. know, like it's, it it's, and that's kind of the, I've always looked at like really doing deep healing work without a body that actually has the capacity to go there is really, really risky and it isn't yes. necessarily the pathway. And what we're talking about is very little, small, small changes, small moments of awareness. Right. And building, I, what you level. said, a body that doesn't have the capacity, right? We don't talk about or think, oh, I need to build my capacity for joy, or I need to build my capacity for safety or connection, but we do, if we haven't spent the majority of our time in that state, this is new for us. And so we do build that capacity a little bit at a time. Yeah. It's like exercise. Mm -hmm. You know, people used to show up here and they'd want to lift heavy weights or whatever it was and be like, we're not even touching a weight until you actually move properly. Mm -hmm. Why would I want to add more resistance and train you to move improperly more effectively? Right very similar to that. And and in in my language, it's we have to help our bodies trust that it's okay to actually feel safe, that it's okay Mm -hmm. to be less hypervigilant, to be less highly mobilized, or to come back to some connection, not being detached, right? right? And we have to help the body trust that. That isn't the mind. That's the body, the whole body mind. So yeah, awesome. Um, You know, want to talk also about my patients and how I help them do that and that it's it's something that can be learned and we can as physicians we can learn how to connect with our patients how to help our patients feel safe how to attune with them that's something that I feel very strongly about um, giving that information to other healthcare providers about how do we attune with our patients and that's not something that we're taught, but yet it's so vitally important for the health of not only our patients, but the health of the providers. You know, one of the ways that I come down during this, you know, hyper vigilant, stressful yeah. day is that time that I have with my patients. Yeah. And it's really can be only like five minutes sometimes in my case, but what it does for my body is tremendous. 
because if I can go into a room and I have a connection with a patient and I, I know that they feel better, they feel more relaxed. Well, I have to get myself in that state first. Mm -hmm. And then when they're in that state also, there's this beautiful resonance that happens and we both leave feeling healthier and connected and upbeat and that carries throughout the day. And so the ability to do that, to take a moment before you enter a patient's room to get yourself into that state and then to have that interaction, that sometimes is what keeps me going throughout the day, yeah. you know, having that throughout the day. And, and I'm really grateful for that. So when you're, when you're entering that door, right? Before you enter that door, mm -hmm. what are your go, what are your sort of go-to things in addition to awareness? Obviously you're checking in, you're meeting your body where it is. Yes. And then yes. what are, what are your, some of your go-to things that, that you sort of do internally, right? Yeah. Before you so, then enter that door. For me, the pause, I have a pause and that's really important for me mm -hmm. and really to just stop everything mm -hmm. I'm doing, just pause. And I do a, quick scan. I usually take a breath. For me, when I breathe out, I really imagine the breath going all the way down through my feet into the ground. Mm -hmm. And that helps me just reset. And then when I enter the room, you know, some, some people, some physicians, when they enter a patient's room, they open the door and they're very affable and they're very upbeat and they're like, Hey, nice to meet you. You know, I'm so, Dr. So-and-so and they're really energetic and I'm, I am not like that. I'm just a little different. Um, I walk in really slowly, really kind of quiet. And I take my cues from my patients mm -hmm. and I get a feel of where they're at before I'm strong or I'm too much of an energy in the room and I can become a big energy in a very short amount of time if that's what is needed but I just get that feel quickly of where are they I love it so what you're doing so it, I'll frame it in in my language is you're meeting your body where it is first mm -hmm. and then you're meeting their body where they are Yes. Whereas that what you described with the, the other physician is they have their one play, they have their one thing and, and everyone has to match them. Yes. Right. And that isn't actually meeting the other where they are. Yeah. So I think their intention is to, their intention is great. Absolutely. Good, right. Yeah. They let's, are. that's a good point. What we see play out is not necessarily a reflection of intention. Right. Right. It, obviously they have really good intention but that isn't meeting everyone where they are. Right. Right. Like what you're doing is you're taking an opportunity to slow things down. You're entering the room, not abruptly. You're mm -hmm. coming in as quietly and as calmly as possible. So as not to send more cues of uncertainty to the patient. Yes. And then you're quickly reading their body, their facial expressions, their yes. tone of voice, their gestures, how they're breathing, their muscle yes. tension. And then you're making a, a judgment of, okay, here's the energy I want to help portray to match where they are. Yes. Still grounded in safety, mm -hmm. but with a level of energy that matches their energy. Right. Yes. Because sometimes I come in and I, that person just needs to talk for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they are like, like this with the blanket, mm -hmm. right? And and sometimes they're just joking around right away and then we just go there. So mm -hmm. really figuring out, they're just, I think, allowing them to take up the space and have the space to know, yeah. okay, where, where do we need to go now? Yeah, you're also doing something that's really important is you're actually not sticking to any agenda right? When you walk in, you've actually kind of put aside any agenda. Obviously, you know what you need to do, yes. but you're not forcing that on anyone. Right. Mm -hmm. You're letting, you're letting the relationship develop first. And yes. if, if we look at the physiology in that 
for a patient, just like a patient's body responds to threat and then gets triggered into a defensive reactive physiology, the patient's body can also reflexively respond to safety and come yes. into a place of accessibility and connection. Mm -hmm. And that accessibility, in addition to forming that trusting relationship, it's actually making their bodies accessible to the treatment, to, to a possibility of healing. Yes. Because the healing, in, the healing occurs internally. However, they need to receive the surgery or receive the help. Mm -hmm. And so you're creating that environment too. Yes. In that, and that's, in that that's a perfect, perfect um, example because when I think about attunement, and what I try to do with my patients, there are four words that I think of, and there are four A's. And um, and so it's awareness mm -hmm. and being aware of our state, being aware of my patient's state, mm -hmm. accessibility, right? Am I accessible to come alongside them? Just what you said, I drop my agenda, I drop my ego, and I just, how accessible am I to this person? And then accountability. I'm accountable to manage my own state. I'm accountable to how I'm going to respond to someone. You know, am I going to take something personally or not? Mm -hmm. And I'm accountable for repair work. That's another thing that we don't get taught as doctors is we're not going to get it right. There's going to be times when we're, we're just off track. Like we're just not syncing with the other person. And, but how do we repair that? Mm -hmm. And then um, authenticity. You have to be yourself or people just spot that a mile away. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah, that, that word accessibility is perfect. Yeah. I love those four A's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so let's, let's, let's just kind of expand on this and see where this goes. So what, what do you do when you just can't find your safe zone? You, you're, you're at that door right? And you, you, you take your long breath, you feel grounded, or maybe that doesn't happen so much anymore, but maybe it happened three years ago when you first started doing this. Like, mm -hmm. what, what do you do? Like, so <clears throat> sometimes, and I, I, the reason I'm going here is like with, with professionals and with performers, there's sometimes no matter what we do to try to help our body feel safe and accessible mm -hmm. on our stage, whatever that is. And, and your stage is that that room, I call it, we change what we then try to execute. We actually modify our execution because we know we can't execute to our potential. We can't actually mm -hmm. access our full skill set. We can't, we can't tap into what we really know how to do. And then through that, it creates a little bit of a loop of, oh, I'm successful with this execution, which that provides some more safety, which then can help us get to that place of accessibility. So do you have, do you have anything like that in, in kind of, do you have a backup plan or, or yeah. something? Yeah. So if I have time, because sometimes I don't, sometimes, you know, I have to see this patient now because they're ready to go to the operating room. If I have time, I will just take a lap around. Our mm -hmm. operating rooms are like a square. Mm -hmm. I will just take a lap around and I'm, I walk a lot. I walk a lot and I'm very aware of how important movement is for me. And I even sometimes like envision myself, like walking, like, like mm -hmm. a tiger or walking, like, um, just so aware of my footsteps and touching the ground or otherwise what I need is not so much stability as like, like I envision, I don't go down the hall, like swaying, right? Like but um, I envision that or just what does my body need right now? And I'll just take a lap around and I'll just envision that. That will make a big difference. Now, sometimes I can't do that. And if I really just need to go in a room and I don't have time, you know what I'll do then is I will just give myself so much self-compassion and just be like, you know what? This one, <laughs> you're just going to be professional. You're just going to go in there and you're going to be professional. Yeah. And, and what I find is when I do that, I actually, things turn out well, Yeah. like we end up connecting. If I'm just like, I have, again, I'm just going to get in and out, give them the information. Um, yeah, I feel so much better just giving myself a pass. 
Yeah. So you're doing a key, you're doing a key thing that I, I'd like to frame. So I, and I'm right, right there with you, right? Like when, when we're not able to find our safe zone or our play zone and really show up how we want to show up, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're relating to your own experience of that differently. Whereas in the past, you might've really blamed yourself or, or had a little bit of guilt or some, something you'd be hard on yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. And now you're actually relating to that going, well, for whatever reason could be, it could be three nights without any sleep in addition mm -hmm. to all of this and, and an interaction I had with one of my children and well, like it doesn't even matter, right. but, but the reality is for whatever reason, I'm giving it my best effort here to meet my body where it is and help myself to be accessible. And I'm just not, and that's self-compassion without beating myself up. And that changes everything. And that allows you in that moment to soften enough to yourself that chances are you're now broadcasting more safety anyway. Right. Which then they're receiving and then exchanging. And that's why you walk out of there feeling better anyway. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Whereas if you had, if you had really been like, I'm going to make myself, you know, <laughs> you know walked in there They're gonna like doing you. much more, right. Tension <laughs> and, and all that. And with, but that's what I would have done before really understanding mm -hmm. this. Right. Or I would have said, I'm going to fake it. I'm just going to fake it. Yes. They'll never know. Right. I'm going to fake it. Right. I, which again, you already touched on it. it. Yeah. You might be able to fake it once, but you, you can't fake it. No. So. No, that's awesome. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and you've also, one of the things in, in that you shared before too, is how often you will kind of sit alongside yes. and that alongside someone is such a big thing, like versus being up front and over top, right. Or above all of yeah. that, like right in front of someone or above from the standpoint of what we're talking about is a cue of risk, a cue of danger, right. a cue of aggression or a cue of right. power, not yeah. equal and not right. trust, not collaboration, not, connection, not collaboration. And, and that's what we're really getting at. And, and that is the same in physician to patient as it is to coach and client, as it is to partner relationship, mm -hmm. right? right. It's, it's all the same. I, I, in, in this little coaching group that I have um, the other day, I, I took some video footage of a tennis match and this, this player was sitting down in between games and he's sitting there and the coach who does, isn't normally his full-time coach. So the coach comes over, he doesn't understand. And he's, he's standing up right in front of him, just standing there in front of him. And he's, he's giving him really positive cues. Like what he's saying is you're doing great and you're doing this. And he's, he's really highly kind of like your physician that you're talking about comes in the room yeah. with all this energy and he's standing up and the player's sitting down and the player's like this. Mm -hmm. just and he's trying to give him cues and the player never once looked up he did like a quick little yeah like, like this and and he and, the, and then the coach just gets more vocal right because i want to help you i want to help you and, right. I, and the player is just totally it's like so too much right Completely, there right? yeah and and just again intentions were awesome the, the coach had yeah. every intention of helping but what he didn't see is how his player was responding he didn't get that that was actually overwhelming the player and the player was detaching the player was completely checked out and the the announce the commentator it was beautiful because the commentators picked up on it the commentator mm. was, i don't even think he's he's listening to the coach right he can't he couldn't no and he wasn't and and it, so it's it's just such a, a a really good in the moment lesson of what you just yes doing you're not coming yeah. in you're not coming in taking over the room you're coming in meeting them where they are right and that and your example right there is just so important when we talk about informed consent with patients that we are just throwing information at them and if they don't feel safe they're not going to remember they're not going to take in what no. we told them possible it's impossible. And so this happens all the time that totally people don't, don't know what you told them no. and it's not no. their fault. No, no, but then we, so you're making me think back. So when I first met 
this player that I was working with, he wanted me to sit down with his coaches. And that was what his coaches said. They go, he never listens to us. We're mm-hmm. telling him all this stuff and he never listens to us. <laughs> You're like, right. <laughs> he couldn't. He, he he couldn't hear you. Right. He doesn't even know what you're saying because you're standing. You don't need to speak him, louder. <laughs> so it, it was just you're saying exactly right. But then, but then the coaches or the physicians who are saying all of this again with good intentions, we're not harshing on the intentions. No, the intentions are sound. But now the 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 coach they were taking it as what's wrong with him, right? Why can't, why, or, you know, we're trying to help him and he doesn't listen. Right. And right. So then they were, they were so fed up. They wanted to quit. Mm. Mm -hmm. Nothing to do with him not wanting to listen either. Right. Like their intentions were good. He didn't intend to turn away and not listen either. They were overwhelming. So So sitting alongside, sitting alongside. I always sit. Yeah. And also the, the position, like, yes. The, the angle, all of that, mm-hmm. you, you know, we know, and, and we've knew that intuitively. Now we understand why. Yes. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. So do you ever, a lot of coaches um, and a lot of people, when they start really becoming what we're calling polyvagal informed, um, they struggle with sort of when asked, what is it? Or how, how, how do you like, what does it really mean to be, to understand polyvagal theory or what, what do you, do you get asked that in what you're doing? Do you have like a way that you explain to people who I know that you're embodying it and you're exchanging it in your role? Are you having to actually share a little more about it? And if so, how, how, how do you do that? What, what is it? Yeah, I really, I, how I see it is an understanding of the different autonomic states that our body can take us into. And I, I emphasize in my work that it, it happens without our permission. So it isn't something that we at the beginning, you know, automatically choose to do. So especially when a patient is coming into the hospital, I mean, their body is going to automatically take them out of social engagement, right? That is the expected thing to happen. You're Mm -hmm. entering a building where you're not going to have as much control as you have elsewhere. So just taking the shame out of it, taking um, out of it, the idea that, that patients are being difficult, or this is something they're choosing. So again, an understanding of our autonomic states and, and how our thoughts, our behaviors result from that. Mm -hmm. And then teaching healthcare providers how to recognize what state their patients are in, what state um, they're in so that they can, again, regulate themselves, not only just to make their patients feel better, but to make themselves feel better, to help um, increase their joy with their work, to help decrease burnout, um, increase satisfaction, so many reasons. Yeah, And that is how, how I go about explaining it. And people are really hungry to have this information. That's the thing that I think surprised me the most is for me, it was just life-changing, but I didn't recognize at that time. Like, I think it's life-changing for everyone. Mm -hmm. Once you recognize that and you have the ability to understand your bodily sensations and what is going on, it gives you so much more power to relate to the world in a positive way, in a way that's empowering and helps you feel more engagement with totally. people that you love and the job that you do. Totally. And that's what life's about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think I, to add to what you were saying, the the first thing that in my own life was it changed how I related to myself mm-hmm. and those bodily reactions. Mm -hmm. Right. And those moments feeling like what you said in the beginning, you're not choosing to react this way. It's, it's happening. And so for me, the, the big thing was understanding and relating to those bodily reactions differently without the shame and the blame and the guilt and the fault and all of that. So that was a huge piece. And then it's in the coaching 
and in the health and wellness world, not everyone is necessarily um, going to get to that second place that you talked about right away, like where it's about right. how you connect and engage with others and, and really grasp the, the power of that piece, that the piece of the social connection really being a neuromodulator of your health and your well-being. That almost to me is like the next piece because you have to get safe enough in your own body and and yes. and relate to your own reactions in a way that makes you accessible to those relationships that actually feed and nurture back into supporting that physiology. Right. And then when you start tapping into that and getting that, then it's just, then it opens everything up. So that's yes. been my own experience. Like, and in teaching or coaching, I don't tend to go there first. I tend, even though that, even though that we know in an ideal world too, that co-regulation, having a self other, that attunement with another is what is providing the foundation for being exploring and curious and bold and going off on your own, like our children, right? right who grow up and leave knowing they can come back and, and all of that. But so that ideally that's where it starts, but I find often in this world of, of dealing more with adults who that hasn't necessarily been their path for a while, where they've been more disconnected to their own bodily feelings and all of that, that initially I start with their self-regulation, yes, the things with self and creating lifestyle habits and patterns and behaviors and practices and awareness and attention and all of those things to build enough homeostasis and safety inside that then foster the the relationships that then feed it all back versus starting with the relationships right no i agree totally because i do believe that you you need to have that build trust right with your yourself and empowerment so that because you do have to have an understanding of which relationships make me feel safe, which yeah. ones should I maybe spend less time with. Mm -hmm. And so it isn't just about, like you said, going out into the world, it's building our inner world, mm -hmm. which starts with how do I feel right now? How do I feel? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I think second to that too, is this, the, the more safe and grounded you feel in yourself, just like a kid going off and playing and getting curious, you can explore other relationships. Yes. And if they don't go where you would hope they would go, you're still okay. Mm -hmm. right? Like, is that, that you don't feel as vulnerable. Right. To be accessible, I guess is really yes. what it is that, that becoming accessible, even to someone you don't necessarily know in a trusting relationship yet, isn't that frightening. Right. You don't actually even feel that vulnerable. Right. But I certainly wouldn't start there. No. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. No. But so, you get to there. Yeah. I think that's where where, where it goes. Mm -hmm. Right. Eventually. So yes. what yeah, I even though it's it's about co-regulation, ultimately what it's given me is this very solid, strong belief of I got this. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I yeah. mean, and I've got this with other people, right? But ultimately, like, I can manage, I can regulate, I can, because I can know, oh, what do I need? What do I need to feel better in my body right now? Yeah, I like that. I got this. Mm -hmm. Totally. So I've been playing around uh, with this empathy and compassion mm -hmm. idea and, and in the physiology of how it's actually a it's toggling back and forth. And, and I would like you to spin on it a little bit and see how it okay. relates to you. So like the idea is that you walk into that room, so we'll frame it in, in your, in your situation. So you, okay. you, you're in a good space, you know, you've done your prep outside the door. You've, you've taken your breath, you've grounded yourself. You're actually feeling pretty good. You're not just going to go to professional mode. You're actually <laughs> feeling pretty good. And you walk in and you just, you see the strain in, in the patient's face and you, you can see their posture and maybe they're, maybe they're huddled over. Maybe you can just feel it. you right. And you immediately know 
they're really, really afraid or they're really just, just scared and uncertain. And they, they, right. So that initially you would have empathy because you feel it. Right. And so if we were monitoring your physiology, we'd see you sort of match their physiology and you'd have a, a flicker of this also fear or whatever they felt in their body. You'd have your interpretation of that in your body. Okay. And that's what I'm calling empathy, mm -hmm. right? It's that you're matching their, their suffering, their hurt, Yeah. but you now, and you, you use the word before self-compassion, you're now approaching and you know that you can't keep sending those sorts of cues to them that you're actually hurting. And you have what, what, if we slowed it all down, you're probably connecting to some other resource that you have when you feel that and it's happening really quickly that then you shift into compassion. Mm -hmm. In other words, your physiology, you've regrouped and your physiology now is back into enough safety, enough ventral vagal control that you're not broadcasting the hurt that you felt from them back to them. Right. 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 And then, and then the dialogue begins and maybe, maybe that opens up something and now they share another expression of more hurt mm. and you, you will feel that again and shift again into empathy, a moment, a flicker, but again, then move back into compassion. So it's mm -hmm. comes this toggling experience and I'm yeah, getting that that's what that. builds the trust. That's what actually mm -hmm. builds the trust because they get that you get them in those flickers of you matching them, but then they also trust that you can help them and you can be alongside mm -hmm. them and they aren't hurting you with their suffering. Right. Yeah, I think that that's very accurate. When you describe it that way, I think that's what I experience frequently with my patients, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think flicker is a good word because I don't stay there. Mm -mm. And um, but I'm able to hold that space for them. But you're not and, numb either. And if you don't have that flicker, right. to me, it's almost like numb. Right, right. Right. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, because it's more than just hearing what you're saying, right? Like I can hear what my patients say, but feel nothing. But mm -hmm. I do feel things, um, mm -hmm. but I don't stay in that empathic state mm -hmm. because I can't. Right. And it does. Well, you could, you could, I mean, but it's, I, it, it's not helping. No, that and it, I, I can't, like for me, I can't, right. I can't stay there with all the patients that I see every day. And, and it, it, it's, yeah, it doesn't serve them and it doesn't serve me because then I don't have a boundary of where I end and they begin. And I need that. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, yeah. So, yeah, that's, that I think um, is an interesting an interesting idea to explore of how does that happen or, or what does it look like when that happens and, and how can, and can that be, can that be taught for people who don't do that? That, that would be interesting to me to look at. Yeah. So I'm getting at that. I think that could be, that could be taught or trained mm -hmm. or, or better word would be, we could help the body and the nervous system become more efficient at moving between those different physiological states because that's what you're doing in the moment. Mm -hmm. So that right. could be done in a variety of different ways, not necessarily just in the workplace patient physician right. relationship. Right. It could be done in an interval training. It could be done in right. hot and cold therapy. It could be done in a, a wide variety yeah. of things just to build the physiological capacity for what's actually happening physiologically when we toggle between empathy and compassion mm -hmm. in a relationship is what I'm kind of getting at. And I think when, when you're talk when you've mentioned like physician burnout, what, when you said, I can't, that to me, what I was hearing is that would lead to burnout. If I, if I get locked into empathy and didn't move into compassion for other and self, I would be locked into this, basically a threat physiology mm -hmm. might not be mobilized. It might actually be shutting down, 
but you'd be locked into a threat physiology all day. Yes. You carried that with you at home, you wouldn't recover. Yeah. Yeah, that's empathy fatigue, right? Right. Which is which is a big part of the burnout. Mm -hmm. You know, and maybe another part is the disconnection, the numbing. Yes. Yeah. People become cynical. Yeah. Uh, you, you no longer have satisfaction. You no longer get that satisfaction from your job with yeah. burnout, right? There's typically three components, right? You become cynical mm-hmm. about your work, about your patients, and then you have emotional exhaustion. Mm-hmm. So all of those things would happen mm-hmm. if you get stuck in empathy. They happen for many, many other reasons right. also right. Sure. Um, in the healthcare system. It's a, you know, a system that needs needs some revamping. Um, but yes, being able to freely move back and forth between empathy and compassion, having that skill, uh, mm-hmm. is helpful. Yeah. So would you say on that, like, so someone who is cynical, are they just numb? Are they detached? Is that what's beneath? No, this? I don't feel like they're detached. I feel like it's more than that. So detached, I see it as is more your apathetic, whereas cynical is really, um, I'm trying to think of the right word, but it, it really is more judgmental okay. I think, than detached. I How think are it, they with their patients? Um, I think that just <laughs> depends on their ability to be professional in front of their patients. But if, but I have seen and worked with over the years, um, cynical doctors and they, and mm-hmm. They aren't, you know, there are definitely situations where they are not the best with their patients because they're, they're at the end of their rope, you know, they're, they have pretty much taken what they can handle. And they've been in probably a, a defensive threat physiology for a long time. And so there's, I think what happens is some of that gets put projected onto the patient. Mm -hmm. And then they're missing out on that key piece that you shared earlier yes. is that they're not actually receiving the no. regulation and the warmth and the welcome back from the patient, which is Correct. what's really, fu- which is what's really allowing you to get through each day. Yes. Really, right. Yeah. And not get burned out, not feel empathetically fatigued. Right. Because you're getting back that, that from them, it's the reciprocal yes. relationship and they're, they're missing that. Right. Completely. Mm-hmm. And, and that I don't want to um, gloss over the fact that there are many things right now that make that very difficult, like sure. the ele- electronic health record, the time restraints put on physicians or many, many reasons that physicians have a hard time totally. spending time with their patients, which is outside of their control. Yeah. Yeah. You're not getting met where you are. And, and right. And as an outsider looking in, we don't know all of that. Right. Right. And it's not, yeah, it's back, back where we kind of started. Like, it's just not, so it was really helpful for me to hear what, what the world is really like for you and for all of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there anything kind of right now that you're really learning or that that's kind of, that's your kind of leading edge that you're really kind of just tapping into that you're growing around or anything? Well, I really, again, I, I love, um, teaching about attunement and because again, in repair work, that's not something that we're taught. And I would, I look forward to a day when medical students get taught about, um, all of these things about our autonomic states, about how to, care for themselves, like in their bodies, about being in touch with their sensations, knowing what they need, Um, a different culture of medicine where you're not expected to do it all on your own, Mm -hmm. where it's okay to need some help every once in a while. And um, yeah, teaching about that, speaking about that. And that is, um, that's coming. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, where you're not a machine. Right. I mean, really, right? And that coming back in touch with the human, the human part of all of us. Yes. Yeah. Understanding that about themselves and understanding that it's okay 
that we're made to have needs and to fulfill those needs. And that we're not going to be able to do that for our patients if we can't do that for ourselves. And oh. that that's not a weakness. That's actually a oh, strength. Actually a strength. Yeah. yeah. There's nothing wrong with, with owning that we need each other. Right. Yeah. Cool. Anything else that you want to say or share? Or... No, thank you. That good? Are we good? Me. Yeah, <laughs> you're good.